I call the chair of the Joint Committee on the Draft Online Safety Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I take the opportunity to wish you and all members of the House and all members of staff in the House a very Merry Christmas. Um, I wanted to take this first opportunity to, um, following the publication of the Joint Committee's report on the Draft Online Safety Bill on Tuesday, just to inform the House of its publication and of the key themes that we have addressed. The Joint Committee, formed as a pre-legislative scrutiny committee, uh, was formed by order of this House and the House of Lords on the last sitting day before the summer recess. For anyone who has been involved in a joint committee of this nature in the past knows that because uh, it has a clear deadline to hit, uh, it is inevitably a race against time. And whilst we had the summer recess to plan and prepare for our hearings in September, we effectively had around 11 to 12 sitting weeks, including taking some of the conference recess, in order to produce our report. Uh, the report was concluded on the last day of the committee's existence last Friday and then published on Tuesday this week. Uh, before addressing the report itself, I would like to thank the members of the committee uh, who worked so hard throughout the inquiry and produced a unanimous report. It was genuinely a very collaborative process uh, in which all members of the committee contributed and I think to have completed that without a division and without, uh, amongst the members at all uh, and to produce a unanimous report I think shows uh, the strength of feeling and the, the importance and the strength of working closely together through that. I'd also like to thank the, uh, the staff of the committee, in particular um, the Commons clerk David Slater, who led a very impressive clerk, a team of clerks and advisers. Without their Herculean efforts, we would not have completed this project within the time frame we were given by the government. Uh, the committee held oral evidence sessions with 50 witnesses. We received 200 written evidence submissions produced a report of 192 pages, totalling around 60,000 words. So it was a huge effort to produce what I think is an important report. This, uh, bill is a bill, this draft bill and this legislation is something that has been of considerable interest to members of the House. We organised the roundtable for members to contribute directly to the work of the committee, as well as three other uh, roundtables working with the University of Cambridge and the London School of Economics. The high number of written evidence submissions, again, I think demonstrates the high level of interest there is in this issue. For those of us who have been following this debate closely over a number of years, this bill feels like it has been a long time in the coming. I think that is because it is anticipated and wanted, but we should still remember that this Parliament will be the first in the world to legislate on such a comprehensive piece of uh, legislation to create regulation for the online world. There are other parliaments in the world that are discussing it, the European Union is discussing it, but we have gone further and when the bill is introduced before the end of this session, as I believe the government intends to do, this, this will be the first and comprehensive bill in the world uh, to, to seek parliamentary approval. Um, I would also like to thank, uh, in addition to my thanks for the members and the staff of the committee, uh, the ministerial team and the Secretary of State at DCMS and the bill team of officials there as well, with whom we had a very constructive and very open uh, dialogue throughout the course of the inquiry. And it was good to see them stand by the commitments the ministers have made, that they wanted the scrutiny process to be an open one and a genuine one. The bill is by, was by no means locked down when it was given to us, and the Secretary of State herself has gone on the record saying she expects the bill to change as a consequence of the work of the Joint Committee, which is good to hear and, uh, and, and also, I think, important. The reason this bill has been anticipated so much is because the online world has become central to our lives. It is where we work. It is where we stay in touch with our family and friends. It is where we, people play games. It is where people get their news and information. It has become our public square. But people are rightly asking the question, what kind of place is that public square? It is increasingly an environment where, for too many people, it is the, it is the forum in which they are abused. It is the forum with which they are, their, their vulnerabilities are targeted and exploited. It is a forum through which hate speech has become normalised. And we are seeing a disturbing trend, of, I believe, of that affecting offline behaviours as well, as well. People are more likely to be subject to attacks because of their race or their sexual orientation or their gender. People are more likely to become victims of scams and frauds contacted through the internet. Um, when people are more likely to receive you know, egregious disinformation that could damage their public health or could interfere and undermine the integrity of elections. We are seeing this taking place around the world, but we experience at home as well. As members of Parliament, we are often subject to abuse. We often have constituents who come to us who have been the victims of abuse. And they say, what can be done about this? What can the social media companies do? There is a presumption that the law applies equally in all areas. 
But I think we all know that the law being applied online has become a very difficult place. It is difficult to get the social media companies to take responsibility for the systems they've created and the activity of the users on those platforms. And we have to recognise as well that this bill does not just address content moderation. We're not just looking at harmful content, abusive content that has no place on the internet. We're looking at the systems that create an audience for that content as well. The bigger area of harm is done by the amplification of content on these platforms. If abuse was being directed by someone shouting in the street, ultimately that person will probably be arrested for it and moved on. But it's difficult to control it when that voice of abuse is being amplified to millions of people. And that is what the systems of social media companies do. And they should be accountable for those systems. They have designed and built those systems to hold the engagement of users. Because the more often they visit the site, the longer they're on it, the more engaged they are, the more valuable they are to the platforms, the more advertising they can sell. And too often the platforms work on the assumption that all engagement is good, that engagement in itself is a positive metric because people wouldn't go on the platforms if they, didn't want, if they weren't enjoying it. But we all know the nature of addiction is that people are returned to things they know are harmful and they know are damaging to them. And it was interesting to hear Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, who gave evidence to the Joint Committee, cite, re cite research from within Facebook in particular, showing how uh, vulnerable teenage girls were having heightened levels of anxiety and depression as a consequence of their experience of using Instagram, but felt at the same time they could not use the platform because all their friends were on it and they couldn't miss out with what, what was on there as well. Yeah. It's disturbing to know, not just, just not to see these problems discussed in cold research documents, but to know the companies themselves know this and are still not doing enough to act on it. That's why what we have to do now is move to a regulatory regime for social media companies and other uh, and big search engines and other big on online firms, where it is the laws passed in this Parliament that apply. That it is not terms of services written in Silicon Valley that are the guiding principle for regulation. It is laws we've written here. That's why the central recommendation and, and change we've, made, we've suggested to the online safety bill is to say that Ofcom, as the independent regulator, should set mandatory codes of practice that will apply, codes of practice that are based on existing laws in this country, that will deal with, of course, the worst kinds of illegal content like child abuse and, and content that promotes and glamorises terrorism. But also we will bring, in, bring into force the equalities legislation, so people, you know, people who expect to be, have respect, expect not to be abused because of their, their race or their sexual orientation or their gender, that that will apply online as well. And the job of the regulator is to set the standards for the companies and explain to them what they are expected to do. We also greatly welcome the work of the Law Commission in suggesting specific new offences as well, particularly offences around knowingly false information being shared on social media platforms with the intention to commit physical harm or, or severe psychological harm to, to other users, uh, to make the promotion of self-harm a particular offence, a particular problem, I think, with vulnerable younger users of social media platforms, to create a new offence around that, to create new offences around cyber fashion, show that the law needs to keep up to, up to speed with technology, and people that use new technology to abuse others should know that the law will come for them. We also addressed the issue in the report of anonymity, something many members of the House have spoken about. Anonymity can play an important role to help victims of abuse and people speaking out against oppressive regimes to, tell, to speak truth to power, fearful of doing, doing it in their own name. But anonymity is also used as a shield by some to abuse others, believing that that anonymity will protect them and allow them to commit acts otherwise would, they will be charged for and face prosecution for. And therefore, in those circumstances, the committee believed that people should be traceable. We should be able to identify people that are abusing others. A request from law enforcement to get that information readily and speedily should be complied with so that there is traceability and people know that even if they do not post in their own name, if they abuse others and break the law, then they can be traced. Age assurance is another important issue the committee considered. We are particularly concerned that children can be vulnerable and they can access content, particularly adult content, they shouldn't have access to all too easily on the internet with, with companies not doing enough to address that. And so we said, we said the company should have effective age assurance policies in place. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, the key to this, and this principle underpins the bill as, as it stands, and we think is very important, is that the regulator has the power to inspect and audit the companies. We will not be reliant on self-declared information reports from those companies, but we'll have the ability to get the information for ourselves, information that too often is only supplied to the outside world by brave whistleblowers and investigators speaking out about it. But we should have access to that information. We should know on what basis the companies are making decisions. The companies should be liable, 
liable if they don't comply with the bill, liable to big fines. Also, we believe, and we agree with the Secretary of State, individual name directors should have liability as well if the companies are in flagrant breach, and there should be a redress for individual users. And uh, I would encourage all members to add the report to your Christmas reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dean Russell. Thank you, Madam.